All right, so there's quite a bit in this little section. There always is, but in the book of Acts, what we're talking about right now, Acts chapter 9, it says in verse 37, it happened in those days, I'm kind of cutting into the middle of the story here, but there was a lady named Dorcas, and she had been sick, and she died, all right? And what direction is getting sick and dying? Up or down? <laughs> you get sick, and then you die, and then they lay you down, right? So that life force that was in us from the Lord, the breath of God that was spoken into us is gone. The person's not breathing anymore, and she died. And Peter was going to go pray. So it says when they had washed her, they laid her in, in the upper room. Now, upper is better than downer. <laughs> so prophetically, you know, upper room is a good thing because we're kind of picturing where, what we want to see happen. And verse 39 says, when Peter came, they brought him to the upper room, and all the wood widows stood by weeping. No, there's nothing wrong with the fact that they were weeping because they loved her and, and they miss her. But he puts them out of the room. Why does he do that? Because he wants an atmosphere of faith. And it doesn't mean that those people didn't have faith. But in the moment, their emotions were overriding their faith. And he felt like he needed to have the atmosphere cleared out. It's not shaming to those people that he has to leave. It's that Peter got one of the keys of the kingdom to say, the more faith I have in the room, the better. And Easter did a really good job a few years ago comparing what happens when we're in prayer before the service. And if people come in with a disrespectful attitude, Easter said being in prayer was like the, the kettle was boiling. But when people came in that were having a little bit more of a carnal mindset, they were just walking out of the parking lot and didn't realize there was an atmosphere of prayer. It was like somebody pouring cold water into a, a boiling pot, right? You see the difference? I never forgot that. It was so clear that we really do have to have respect for the Lord in all the things that we're doing. Because in order for him to do a miracle, he doesn't even need us. But he expects us to create a landing strip for his presence to come. And when there's unbelief in the room, that stops that from happening, right? And, and we really have to fight that religious spirit that says, oh, I've tried this and it doesn't work. Well, no, faith says, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to have a tenacity about my walk. And Peter puts them out of the room. And then he says he knelt down and he prayed. And I often have wondered what he was thinking, right? It's an early church. He was with Jesus a lot. He's not praying over her yet, okay? Because we find out later it says he turned to her. And, and so right now, he's not praying over her. He's just kneeling down and he's praying. And as, as I was thinking about this message this week, it's like, Lord, gravity's trying to take her down. It's that downward force. But I pray that enough would happen in her system that those blood cells would start moving again. That you would start stoking up movement in her life. And the thing that is shut down will be restarted again by your power coming into her. Because that's who you are. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us today, right? So he could take dead things. He calls the things that are not as though they are. So Peter's praying and saying, Lord, fill this room right now with your power. Take her off the runway and start that, the cells in her body moving, then moving and circulating so that they hit that point of speed where the law of lift will overtake the law of gravity that's trying to pull her down. Makes it a whole different way of praying, isn't it? So he's just saying, I surrender to your power. I say, fill this room with the power to bring a dead body back to life. Not because he's this great man of God, because he believes. It's by faith. He believed that God could do it. And he knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. So he prayed over here, and then he turns to the body. I guess at the time in the moment when he was praying, that he felt that power was in the room. Boom. He turns and says, Tabitha, arise. That's got to be one of the shortest prayers ever to raise somebody from the dead. <laughs> right? At least what he spoke. He prayed before, but we don't have to yell and scream, do we? We're, we're, we're with a, a God of power. Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. She saw Peter. And she sat up, not down, up. You normally sit down. She sat up because she was flat. Isn't that a better position to be in? Somebody asked you how you're doing? So I'm vertical. Sure beats horizontal. Sure beats being held down. Is everything perfect? No, but that's okay. I got a perfect God. 
And then there was just a series of, of scriptures that I've been trying to share. And I hope it's, it's uh, resulting in the fruit of hope in our lives, right? And, and it's really been confusing. So don't beat yourself up if you haven't been perfectly handling the COVID crisis. Most of us have never had anything like this, right? Five months of lockdown, people passing away, not being able to go to a funeral, not being able to honor them. Like so many different ways things are different. Never mind arguments over politics and, and, and the other things. So it creates like this witch's brew of potential ways you could be attacked. And yet, in Psalm 73, I won't turn to the scripture, but we, we quoted it a few weeks ago. The, the psalmist was saying, you know, I just can't believe the ungodly people don't have the same problems I have. They're ignoring you, and they seem to be prospering. And he said, it was all too confusing to me, and I almost lost, I, I took it to me, and I almost stopped serving God because I got so confused. And he said, until I went into the sanctuary, and then my perverted and distorted mindset shifted, and I understood their end. So when you're not sure what to do, you pray. That's what that's telling you. That you say, I need to counter the force that's trying to pull me down in my emotions right now. And when you pray, you say, Lord, I need you to fill me with your spirit. I need you to fill me with your thoughts right now to override what the enemy's trying to do to attack me. We'll get to other things that we can do as well. How about Isaiah chapter 40? I know a lot of you would know this. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They're going to mount up. And the, and the eagles know how to work the drafts so that they're high above and can see down below into that storm. They can go high above in that storm. And we had a teacher a few years ago, well, many years ago now, he taught on the eagle. And one of the things that I, I never forgot, he said, and I haven't fact-checked this, so you could fact-check me, but this is what he said, that eagles have, they're really like the alpha predator of the uh, bird world. And when they mate, they have to fly high enough into the atmosphere that they mate in a free fall. Meaning, if you can't get high enough, you can't reproduce. <laughs> see it in the spirit? You see it? If you can't get high enough in the spirit, if you're allowing gravity to keep pulling you down, you're vulnerable down there. Because they could have been attacked in that moment when they were reproducing, right? And now they go high enough, and in a free fall, they're still high enough, and they're safe. Because nothing can attack them up there. Oh, I never forgot that. So if I'm not hearing from the Lord, i got to get higher. i got to just evict some of the baggage in my balloon to get higher, higher up. And then we used to sing a song that had this line in it. Who will ascend God's holy mountain? Who will abide in his presence? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, right? These are called the songs of ascension in the Psalms. And having been now to Jerusalem and seeing what, what it looks like, the people that were coming from far away, they would have to come up into the mountain of Zion. So as they were coming up the mountain, they would sing songs of ascent. Who will ascend? People with a lot of baggage? No. <laughs> See what I'm saying? It's all over the Bible. I could give you many, many examples. I love the one where Jesus in Luke chapter 4 was just walking out. They wanted to throw him off the brow of the hill, it says, remember? And he just walked through them. So the law of lift just carried Jesus right out of that place. And he could do the same for you if you don't get hijacked. And then another one in the life of David, and this is really a very personal one, right, about where you make your decisions and when you might feel justified to cheat a little bit, right? So David was prophesied over by Samuel that he was going to be the king. He goes and he kills Goliath. Amazing. Young guy, kills Goliath. Nobody else wanted to do it. But he gets attacked by Saul because Saul is jealous. And he's on the run and he's living in caves. And all of a sudden while he's in caves, he's got these guys that come and they're kind of the downcast people. But some of them became mighty men because of his leadership and the impartation that he had. And, and I want to just say this part too just for a minute about Chuck Pierce. The impartation piece is really important to understand that even if you're not physically on the property, you're part of, of this tribe. And when he's here and he's prophesying over this tribe about what place we have, you get to receive that. So you should watch it and you should go back and look at some of the old videos of when he was here because he was speaking about today. And it's a little hard to understand him when he's speaking because he's speaking into the future about things that we don't quite know about yet. But we have it on faith because of his history that 
whatever he was saying, some way we're going to see that come to pass. That's been the truth of, of, of the prophecies he said over us. So there's an impartation. So I, I thought of that because as David was on the run, there was one point where he and his men were hiding in a cave. And it says that Saul walked in by himself to use the bathroom that was in that cave. There wasn't really a bathroom. You get it, though. So they were hiding in the back end of the cave, and while he's there, vulnerable, again, just by himself, all his men are saying to him, what? God has just delivered your enemy on a platter. You're supposed to be the king. Take him out. And he went and he just took a little piece, cut a little piece off of his robe, remember? And he said, I can't touch God's anointing. I'm not going to do it. God is going to have to do this for me. That's a really hard one, isn't it? It would have been so easy to just take matters into his own hands and just kill his enemy and ascend to the throne. I've been living in caves long enough. But he had enough of a knowledge of that key of the kingdom to say, no, God put me here and he's going to place me on that throne and I'm not going to touch God's anointing. Boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? When it looks like the easy way out, it looks like the convenient way, often sin does. Sin is the natural state that we were born into. And he even got, David got convicted just about cutting that little piece of the robe off because it was disrespecting the office. Oh, boy, that's a Selah moment, right? Because leadership deserves to be respected, even though they're not perfect people. But if you're disrespecting leadership and then you want to go lead something, guess what? That's going to travel with you. Don't want that, right? You want to treat others the way you'd want to be treated, and, and that's a spiritual law. That's a little a side commercial. 